So we're now live. Thank you very much. Megan, I'll let you uh, get us started. All right. Welcome to the Link Senior webinar, everyone. We're going to get started in just a minute. Give folks some time to get into the room here. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having us. Yeah. So Karen, uh, here are the slides that you saw the other day. Just uh, tell me uh, next slide. I'll, uh, I'll do that. All right, good afternoon and welcome to today's Link Senior webinar. Today we are providing one free NAB, NCAP, and or NCC DP CEU credit. We are not able to provide CEUs to people who join only by phone, so you must be logged into the Zoom webinar room for the full hour to receive credit. The Zoom webinar room will track how long you're in the room and send that as a digital report to me. At the end of the webinar today, I will provide the required post-webinar CEU survey evaluation link in the webinar room chat box, and I will also send it by email this afternoon. Please be sure to check your email spam folder. If you don't receive the link this afternoon, please email me right away so that I can send it to you directly. I'll paste my email in the chat box now. You need to fill out that survey no later than midnight Eastern time this Thursday, October 22nd to be eligible for the CEU credit if you are not looking for CEU credit, we still want your feedback, so please go ahead and fill out the short survey as well. CEU certificates will be issued by email at the end of the day on Friday, October 23rd this week. Again, please check your spam folder that day. You will also receive a PDF of today's slide deck presentation and a recording of today's webinar by email later this afternoon. We are live streaming this event in our Activity Strong Facebook group, but for CEU credit, you must be registered for the webinar and logged into the Zoom webinar room. And with that, I'll hand it over to Charles D. Bill Morin, CEO and co-founder of Link Senior. Thanks a lot, Megan. Welcome, everyone. Actually, welcome, everyone, seriously. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm actually personally very excited for today's meeting. Um, I want to I I thank uh, Karen Love, Executive Director from the Dementia Action Alliance, uh, for, for actually accomplishing something that we've been wanting to do for a while, which is to invite um, you know, people living with, with cognitive change and dementia uh, today. And so I, I want to, I think we all have some story that brought us to where we are today. Um, mine, like, often starts with uh, close uh, connections with older adults in my life. And so, um, so thank you for that. So um, as, I, as we get started for today's webinar, just a, a quick reminder, which is um, given the, the large number in the audience, we do not monitor the chat uh, function of Zoom, but we do monitor the Q&A. So feel free to meet and greet other people in the chat. If you have something specific for uh, Karen, Lori, or Chuck, uh, please uh, feel free to do that in the Q&A. So just a little few words of introduction. Uh, like uh, Megan said, my name is Charles de Vilmarin, and I am the CEO and co-founder of Link Senior. Um, a lot of you are repeat uh, viewers of these webinars. Uh, we started these webinars uh, two years and a half ago because we firmly believe that the older adult that lives in senior living uh, if we were to, if we want to increase the quality of their life, increasing the quality and frequency of education of staff is essential, right? So every person on, in the audience today, if you work in a retirement community, we firmly believe at Link Senior that the more we educate you with the best practices out there, the more you'll be equipped to do uh, your work and therefore uh, together we will increase the, the quality of life of the older adults that you serve. Uh, in this journey, because it truly has been a journey, we've been um, blessed with fantastic speakers coming from all sorts of different areas of expertise. Um, you'll probably recognize some of them. I think that, you know, besides the fact that they're truly experts, including today, in, uh, in the domain of expertise, a lot of them come from requests uh, from people like you. So this serves as an invitation to please consider sending us thoughts and ideas of who we should invite uh, on these webinars. With um, this increased 
social isolation that's hitting everybody uh, on planet Earth, we have had a lot of requests to arrange different ways for all of us to meet each other. And so this is why we're very excited. This is the first time we're going to do it. We decided to do an Activity Strong Huddle at the end of this webinar. So if you want to stick around a little bit and just meet other people like you, we are opening another Zoom meeting where we'll use the breakout room feature of Zoom and we'll match people randomly, I think, uh, three, four, or five people. So you can stick around. Everybody's welcome, as always. It could be uh, five minutes or, if you want, the whole hour. Um, I want to personally thank Lori for helping us manage these. So Lori will be our host uh, today at 2. And um, the, the invitation for this is on our Facebook, uh, Activity Strong, and I think that Megan is probably going to paste that in the, in the chat today. So again, another way that we're trying to help you, um, you know, in your job and, and that particular way is, is through networking and just finding out what other people do and what they, they challenge and some of their successes. So, you know, just two little background pieces about Link Senior, uh, because as we host these meetings, I think it's uh, a lot of people ask questions about what we do. So essentially, I founded, co-founded, sorry, this resident engagement platform for senior care. We are based in Washington, D.C., and um, essentially a lot of our work is about helping uh, people like you in a, in a resident engagement function engage the older adults in a meaningful, purposeful way every single way, every single day, sorry, and also help your organization match uh, what's called engagement with um, quality of life and clinical and financial outcomes. So this is what we do. And if you're interested, we have a few announcements at the end. Uh, feel free to stick around for that. We, um, four years ago, we started this big campaign called All People Are Cool. And when COVID hit uh, our country in March, we also decided to do something for activity and life enrichment professionals. So we started a very large and, and successful uh, campaign called Activity is Strong, which is there to not only acknowledge the essential work that you all do, but educate and empower you so that regardless of the challenge, you are equipped to again provide meaning and purpose in the lives of the older adults that you serve. So as I said, uh, I, I couldn't be excited for the timing of hosting a webinar with Karen Love. She's the Executive Director of the Dementia Action Alliance. And Karen, if that's okay, I'll let you introduce yourself a little bit just in two slides. Um, but I actually had the pleasure of meeting Karen at a conference, I think, a while ago, right? Like five or six years ago? Yeah. And obviously, I, I'm very familiar with her work and one of the numerous supporters of her, her organization. So I think just I'll do just a couple uh, sentences to frame today's discussion and, and hopefully provide an introduction to Karen's uh, work and her organization and having uh, Laurie and Chuck join us today. I think that if you reflect, if you take just a pause on what we are all going through with COVID-19 and this pandemic in the world, I think that probably something that was always true but is often reminded to us these days is that however we think about it, uh, in the end, COVID-19 is disrupting almost every aspect of our society, right? But the one place that is living through the biggest disruption, unfortunately, is our industry. So this is, you know, we, we should be reminded of that, is that one, everybody's affected, but really aging and especially senior living is really deeply disrupted. But I think that the other reminder, which is very important, and that has always been the case, and it will always be the case, is that the pursuit of meaning and purpose is a basic human right, right? We should never, never forget this. Regardless of who we are, the age, the background, what we do in society, it is a basic human right to be able to pursue meaning and purpose, and if we cannot, to be assisted or to collaborate, right? So collaborate is something that we've weaved into our definition at Link Senior of resident engagement. And I thought it was important to be reminded of that 
because although it's challenging, and I, you know, I'm not in a community. I haven't been in a community since March, to be honest. But I'm talking to people like you every single day, and I know that our jobs are difficult. But I think that if we could use some kind of north star to help guide our work, is this: is that regardless of the age of the preferences or where we are physically and cognitively, we should always be invited to collaborate to find purpose every day. So with that, uh, this could serve as a quick introduction. Karen, I will um, give it up to you and I just want to deeply from the bottom of my heart thank you again for helping us uh, make this happen and I look forward to this uh, fantastic conversation. Thank you. Thank you so very much for inviting us here today. Um, Chuck McClatchy and Lori Shearer both are living with dementia. Uh, they're going to be our discussants. Uh, Chuck is living with Alzheimer's disease, and he can tell you a little bit more. And uh, Lori Shearer is living with mixed dementia, Alzheimer's and frontotemporal. Uh, but I'd like to talk before just to frame things. And if you wouldn't mind, Charles, if you could bring up the DAA slides, I wanted to just give you all an overview and a perspective. Um, I hear somebody saying that my volume is low. Uh, I've just turned it up. Does that help? Hopefully that will help. Um, and the next slide, please. So our organization Next slide. The Dementia Action Alliance is a national nonprofit organization, and we were, I am a co founder. Uh, we were formed in 1996. So we're coming up on um, a quarter of a century. And one of the things that we learned early on I'm a gerontologist, and at this point have worked almost 40 years in the field. And we realized that like a lot of conditions uh, in the early days, like for example, uh, Down's syndrome, when children were born with Down's, there was just sort of, there's nothing we can do mentality. And they didn't, many of them didn't develop. Um, we have that same mentality now as a society, we don't have, there's nothing we can do because they don't think there's a medical treatment, but there is a ton of things that people can do to impact. And you'll hear from Chuck and Lori, um, you know, some specifics about that. And so we're still at a, an early stage really in shifting our understanding and, you know, how we how we interact and engage individuals living with dementia. So first of all, um, our organization works to um, have dementia better understood and what better way to hear from people that are living um, with the symptoms that we believe dementia is a disability. The uh, United Nation Convention on the Rights of P Persons with Disabilities accepts dementia as one of the disabilities. Uh, the US has not ratified that, but we strongly believe it is a disability requiring accommodations for some of the symptoms. Um, and we believe very strongly in the uh, philosophy, nothing about us without us, because for so long, people living with symptoms haven't had their voice at the table. They, it's always been through a care partner or someone else. Next slide, please. So what we are focusing on at DAA is enlightening about the stigma and misperceptions. Through our National Speakers Bureau, we're a platform for voices to be heard uh, in things such as this webinar but in other ways as well. For example, we're working on two projects with the National Academies of Sciences, uh, of bringing the voices and perspectives and insights of people living with dementia to two national projects. It's the first time they've ever done this and it's been really life-changing um, for those involved. And of course, then the information is more informed. Um, we connect people who are living with dementia together. 
that peer-to-peer -peer contact is very important. Um, learning to live proactively with symptoms. So often people get diagnosed and you know, they aren't told well, how you live with this chronic condition. Um, beneficial technologies, um, we are involved. We have a technology work group uh, and are involved in identifying technologies that can be very um, beneficial and how to use them, uh, for example, technologies that are already out there. So um, one is Alexa. We have uh, somebody who is living with uh, dementia at home still, and he's always losing things. And he's learned to use Alexa. Um, he goes, oh, I have a girlfriend, Alexa. When I come in, I put my keys down and I say, Alexa, I put my keys on the kitchen counter. And then later when he goes to look for his keys, Alexa, where are my keys? You put your keys on the kitchen counter. So these kinds of things are, um, you know, are, are, you know, normalizing how we live um, with symptoms. Uh, and then of course, person and relationship centered practices. Um, next slide, please. So, I had the privilege of getting to know and meet Richard Taylor while he was alive. He was a professor at Rice University um, who had early onset Alzheimer's. And he was one of the first in the US to speak out about living with a condition um, on a international platform, a national and an international platform. And he would say, help enable me not further disable me. So for example, when um, he bumped into a friend uh, out in the community, he goes, you don't call me anymore. How come you don't call? And the friend would say, well, I don't know what to say. And Richard would tell them, just say hello. You know, I mean, that's, that's how we do. Next slide, please. And just to put it in perspective, if we don't provide accommodations, can you imagine, for example, Stephen Hawking, if no accommodations were ever made for him, the contributions the world would have lost. Um, a brilliant man who was able and, um, you know, until the day he died to be very effective. So um, we do need to think about, you know, how we accommodate and support individuals who are living with symptoms. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over and um, sort of serve as a moderator and um, we'll have our panelists. So ladies first, Lori, we'll start with you. So what were some of the things that led you to seek a diagnosis? What were some of the symptoms and signs you were seeing? Um, definitely a beginning a change in behavior. Um, I was becoming agitated with people and, and events, which was totally different from my personality. Um, I was forgetting things that, and things were seeming challenging to me. Things that I would do every day were suddenly becoming challenging. My husband was noticing changes, like I'd get lost coming home from work, which I traveled every day, obviously, um, but I'd get lost. Then one day I said to him, honey, we really need to get the dogs groomed. And he was like, all right, I heard you the first eight times. But to me, I was saying it for the very first time. So I didn't understand why he was upset. And then he realized something's wrong because within an hour, she didn't realize it she had done that. So there's a number of things. The It's not just forgetting, it's your your agitation, your change in personality, um, just getting confused over things that you've done for years and years. Thank you. Um, Lori, what do you want to tell us a little bit about what you experienced leading up to your diagnosis? Oh, sure. Mine was uh, a little more insidious. It, uh, looking back now, my symptoms actually started about probably four or five years before my diagnosis. Mm -hmm. uh, at that, that time, I was the electrical operations superintendent for uh, the Phoenix area and was handling about a $25 million budget with 
75 people in five different traffic groups. And I was always working with PowerPoint, uh, Word, and, uh, and Excel, doing spreadsheets and giving briefings and stuff. And um, it got to the point where I couldn't remember how to insert data and insert pictures and, and things like this. And I just kind of blew it off as, well, I, I'm just busy. I Either I would ask somebody else to do it or um, you know, ask for their help or ask them to do it because I was just so, so busy. And this went on for probably about three years. And then I actually let, I retired from the state of Arizona and went back to work in my uh, field that I love, which was ITS, which is the big black computer screens along the freeway and all the cameras and all the monitoring systems. And I took a uh, superintendent position in Dallas, Fort Worth at a construction company that also had a maintenance group uh, that worked with the uh, uh, state of Texas. Um, as soon as I went back to the technical side, I realized I was forgetting um, things I used to teach, uh, how to program something, how to troubleshoot systems, um, you know, how systems need to be installed. And this went on for probably only about four or five weeks. And then I finally went and told the, um, the owner that, you know, I, I, I had to resign because I, the, the job was too physical because I was working um, 10 hours a day, you know, five, six days a week. And so I just put it off as that. And then I went to work for Lowe's and my memory problems followed me. I couldn't remember where things were at in the store. And I worked in the plumbing and electrical department. And when somebody would come in with a problem, normally they can, you know, tell you your problem and you kind of visualize it in your mind as to exactly what, what part they're talking about. Well, I was having trouble doing that. I couldn't get that picture sometimes and ended up giving people sometimes the wrong part. Well, the aha moment came when my partner, Bobby, she brought home a little red desk for me to put together. And I I've always loved to put things together. I could read over the instructions once, put them together. And I, I it really, I love doing it. Well, this should have taken about maybe 15 minutes. Well, an hour later, I'm still working on this little desk and it will not go together correctly. So I just said, you know, it's getting late. I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. And she goes, no, 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 this, no, something is wrong here. We, we need to talk. And then she, We've always been very open with each other. And she goes, that's not the only thing that's going on. You're not doing things I ask. You're not conscious when I asked you a question. If you're doing something, you start tasks and, and don't complete them. You get distracted re really easy. And your anger and frustration levels are, are real bad. She goes, I think, you know, maybe you should just go get checked. And so that kind of led to going to the doctor and, and the whole process. Thank you. Lots of people who have not been through uh, the process of a loved one or they themselves don't really realize what's involved uh, in getting a diagnosis and what information you do or don't get. Lori, would you mind sharing your process to get uh, a diagnosis of dementia? It was horrible. Um, first, I went through, I, I went to the family doctor and we said, something's wrong. Uh, I had been very good at Excel and had been in computer programming and suddenly I couldn't add every time if I used a calculator or if I used um, Excel to try and come up with figures, they were wrong. So we went to the doctor and he sent us to a psychologist who sent us to a neurologist who sent us to a neuropsychologist who says, well, four doctors later, they were referring me once again. And this time they referred me to a doctor in Philadelphia, which was like two hours away. I was put through over 30 hours of neuropsych testing. I had um, a number of uh, neuroimaging one of the series of tests that I had done lasted six hours. They passed me from one person to another without a break. Uh, they just sent me off to the next person. Um, once I was diagnosed, the fifth doctor said, I'm simply telling you what the other four 
suspect it, but didn't want to tell you, and that is that you have early onset Alzheimer's and FTD. And I looked at him and I said, well, what about my work, my career? And he turned and he looked at my husband, not even at me, and he kind of snickered and he said, you need to focus on final preparations. Call an elder care attorney, spend time with your family, and come back in six months. Let's see how much you've progressed. We were given no literature. We were given no support, no encouragement. It was just a death sentence is pretty much what it felt like. So we went out in the car and we just sat in the car and cried and cried. Like so many people, our image of someone with, with Alzheimer's or dementia was somebody old and in a wheelchair and not knowing who their loved ones were. So, and especially since he said, spend time with your family. Um, it just was one of the hardest, hardest things that I think I've ever been faced with was the day we got the diagnosis. And Lori, did you get um, walk away from that last uh, physician's meeting with all kinds of information so you knew what to do next? We received nothing. And in fact, we said, do you have any information, especially on FTD? I mean, I knew the I knew what Alzheimer's was, at least I thought I did, but I had never heard of FTD. It was like flowers on the brain. That kind of sounded like a good thing, right? Well, it's not. Um, and so we asked him for some information and um, he said, oh, call the Alzheimer's Association, they'll help you. And that was it. Yeah, okay. That was Thank it, you. no more. Thank you for sharing that. Chuck, how about you? What was your process to get diagnosed like? Well, actually my process was considered to what other people had talked to, my process was fairly quickly. Um, once I went to my primary care doctor and kind of told him exactly what, what symptoms were going on, he uh, immediately you know, got a, a referral to a neurologist. And luckily the neurologist just in, uh, we lived in Fort Worth was, his specialty was dementia. And I walked in you know, for the first appointment and he had me do a, um, it's called a mini cognitive test. Um, and one of the questions he asked was, name four-legged animals. Well, anybody normally can name 30, 40, 50 four-legged animals. Well, in my mind, I could name four. And it was a feeling really that I've never had before is the information wasn't, wasn't there. Um, it's not like, you know, you can think, oh yeah, there's this and oh yeah, there's this. It, it was blank. Uh, he might as well have been asking me to sing the Star Spangled Banner in Swahili. I, I, I just didn't have a clue. And so he said, okay, well, we're going to go you to test. And it was kind of similar to what Lori had talked about. I went through the, um, the PET scan and the MRI, and my neurological testing was uh, uh, about six hours. And so we, we came back in, and he, he starts talking to me, and he goes, well, your brain is shrunk. The fissures in your brain are twice the size of a normal person. He goes, your, I, your IQ was measured at 74. And uh, you need to go home, get your affairs in order. You have early onset Alzheimer's disease. Um, and I'll see you in six months. And kind of that was it. And... We, we left and I don't really remember too much of the ride home. I know that we, we cried a lot and, and just, what do we do? Um, we had, they gave us nothing. So Bobby, she wants to know things. She goes straight to the internet. And when you look up dementia on the internet, it is terrifying. Yeah. Life expectancy for what I had was three to five years after diagnosis. So you didn't know whether you were only gonna be around for five or six months before you would require advanced care. And all of these images 
all of the things that we know are going to happen, I, I started having severe panic attacks where it was, I couldn't even hardly catch my breath. So uh, one thing that did help was uh, we found a, count, uh, a therapist that surprisingly worked in, in specialized in senior issues. And uh, so that kind of started the healing process, but the diagnosis process was just horrid. Um, no information at all from the doctor. And basically the same as Lori just said, um, go home, get your affairs in order, come back in six months, bye. Chuck, what year were you diagnosed? Uh, 2016. And Lori, what year were you diagnosed? 2013. Okay, and just to, I know these are just two individuals, but our organization works with a lot of people and what they're describing is very common. And the reason we talk about it is, um, it is heartbreaking. Uh, I see some of the, um, the points being made in the chat, um, but what it is is um, eye-opening that we really need to have the medical profession because they don't intend to do harm. But you know, when, when you get this kind of diagnosis, it's pretty dynamic and dramatic and it's chronic. You live for a long time. And so how do we go ahead? You know, what do we do to go forward? And you're gonna hear these are two people who are, are my heroes um, because as you can see, they are um, champions and advocates of teaching others um, because you have to kind of know the background to then, you know, go forward. So um, I, I think we got the impression that it was pretty life altering to get these diagnoses, um, Chuck and Lori, and a um, whole grieving process. We don't tend to, as a society, think about connecting the um, stages of grieving with getting a dementia diagnosis. Um, but you all went through and got to acceptance um, and then deciding to live proactively. Lori, could you describe for us how that process went? Because um, so many people don't seem to get to the acceptance and then being proactive. How did you do that? You know, you, you come home and I had been used to working 60 hours a week. I, I was very into my job and uh, you come home and you, and you can't work anymore, especially I had been vice president of a bank at one point and yet I couldn't add and subtract. I mean, you know, that kind of ruins your chances for working. Um, and you kind of sit around and it, first thing is, you take what the doctor said for granted. The doctor says, go home and die. And what do you do? You prepare to die. And our focus was on dying. Um, I didn't really have, I had no purpose anymore because I didn't have a job anymore. I didn't have a career anymore. Um, I, it was just very, very depressing. And you first thing I did was I, I did that list of things to do that you say you're always going to get to someday, clean out a closet, clean out a whatever, and hope that you can find things that'll make you feel fulfilled. But nothing does. Um, getting to that to-do list was great, but it was so, I felt so empty, so hollow. I've always been a motivator. I was a sales trainer and I, I've always been an upbeat person. And I got to the point one day where I kicked myself in the tush and I said, this is not you. And I just decided, you know, if I have one day that I can think and that I can recognize people, just one day, I want that one day to be making a difference in this world. I want that one day to be impacting others. and helping other people that are diagnosed that they don't have to go through what I did. What I found was I then found a group of people on the internet called Virtual Memory Cafe and 
Um, the doctor had led me to believe that I was a real freak. I was the only person in the world under 65 who had dementia. And I went on this Zoom and holy schmoly, there was other people that had dementia that were under 65. I started meeting some wonderful people and we helped each other. We supported each other. We gave each other strategies and support. And then I started writing a blog and writing about my feelings, which really helped me as part of the healing process. Because the more I wrote, um, the more I really felt I could express my hurt. And yet I could also say, Dadgum it! I'm not putting up with this. I've got to live. And in fact, I'm not going to just live. I'm going to make the best of every day and I'm going to thrive. And through my writing, um, I was introduced to Dementia Action Alliance, which has been such a life changer to me because it helped give me a purpose. Um, through advocacy and really helping other people, it's given me a purpose. Saddest part, I think, about the diagnosis is how many times people will look at you and say, well, you don't look like you have dementia. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to look like. Um, I guess I need to work on that. Um, because as a society, we don't understand. Dementia is like a roller coaster. I have really good days like today where I can talk to people and I have some really not so good days when I'm disoriented and confused and can't figure things out. I had to learn to live in today. And if for this very moment, if for right now, I'm having a good moment, I'm going to rejoice and make the best of it. Um, and man, when the bad times come, well, I just pull out my emotional support dog here and let her hug me and, and help me through. Um, you need some support during the, the hard times, but you also need people to understand, treat me like a person, treat me like I was before. Focus on my abilities, not my inabilities. And most important, I'm not preparing to die anymore. I'm living with dementia and I, I intend to live as much as I possibly can. Oh, Lori, that's so heartwarming and uplifting. Thank you. Chuck, how about you? How did you go from, you know, you and Bobby crying in the car to you know, the wonderful and caring advocate you are today. How did you come to acceptance? It was a long, long fight. Um, I was kind of the same place Lori was. I mean, I was, you know, you're feeling far, sorry for yourself. You're mad, you're frustrated. Everything that was in front of you before is now gone. You know, everything that, that you thought was important are gone. And this went on for a month or so. And then Bobby finally set, set me down and says, um, you know, they gave me that little kick in the rump that Lori talked about saying, you know, look, this is not you. You've got to stop this. So, and it, and it was, I mean, I spent 20, 22 years in the Air Force as a instructor flight engineer. I worked 21 years for the Department of Transportation. And I've, I've always been a succeeder and a driver. And it, it just that flame went out. Well, we, we got it at least glowing a little bit. I went to a therapist who, uh, uh, she dealt with senior issues and she taught me how to control those images of, of what's going to happen to you in, in, in the future to be able to put those behind kind of a closed door. And in the beginning, that door comes open quite a bit but you go ahead and you close it again. And so the, the, the time gets different. And like Lori says, you have to find another passion. Um, when Bobby was on the internet, she found uh, a support group that we went to, which was phenomenal. And I remember the first day I walked in, there were people sitting there that have the same diagnosis I do that have been there for five, six, seven, 10 years. And it was like, wow, oh, 
maybe I won't die next year, you know, and it kind of gives you hope. And I found that by talking about what I went through and, and where we're at now may, gave me that passion. And the uh, moderator for our group asked me if I would talk at a caregivers conference. And it was my, my first indication was, what am I gonna tell them? They're living with it. They know what it is. And so I, I, I did my, my spill at the caregiver conference and I was amazed because there was 20 or 25 people that came up afterwards and was asking questions. Um, and it, it kind of dawned on me then that this is a very quiet disease and people don't want to talk about it. It's like they're, they're embarrassed about it. And I continued to talk. And in 2016, I got selected to the uh, Alzheimer's National Early Stage Advisory Group for a year and got to go around talking to conferences and conventions about um, dementia. But when that was over, there was no place for me to talk anymore. And luckily I met the, a beautiful gentleman, Mike Belleville, who I was on the committee with, who by, kind of became my mentor and he kind of led me to and Lord, meeting Lori at a, at a, on a chat, one of those chat cafes brought me to DAA. And I was just, I was in awe of, of the people that were there and how it was ran. And I will never forget my first trip with DAA as a speaker was with Lori and, uh, and Jackie, and it was to Philadelphia. And I tell this story all the time because it is so important. We were talking to two different uh, facilities. And after the last one, when we ended, we were standing down talking with everybody and this lady came up and she was crying. And, you know, uh, she goes, I want to thank you guys so much. This, this has been so important to us. She goes, my husband for the first time talked to me and said, you know, I believe I, I belong here. I know that I have dementia and it changed their lives. And just by us talking with people, I will talk to anybody. Every person that I'm around knows I have uh, dementia. The people that I play golf with know that I have dementia. And it started a lot of conversations. Um, and I think that's the most important things. And with me, humor became extremely important because I realized that if you can take that sympathy card and throw it away and take the tragedy card and throw it away and just talk to people one-on-one -on -one and be able to laugh and joke with them, they're more apt to ask questions. Well, how are you living like the you are with a terminal diagnosis? Well, I do this, you know, and be very open with them and hopefully more people will come out and be open and says, this is how I do it. Because it's, it's not a death sentence. You have a complete life to live. And if you can make other people smile, then you have a good day. And be able to laugh and joke. Um, and it's always that even people with dementia, we can laugh, we can learn, and we can love. And that's, that, that's pretty good. Thank you. Um, we want to leave time for uh, question and answers. So uh, I don't know, Charles, do, do you want to moderate the questions? Uh, I'm not really seeing them. Yeah. Um, we, yeah, we can definitely look at it. I, I have one question, which is, uh, if you don't mind, um, Chuck and Lori, we have right now 689 people uh, today, right now with us right now, that live and serve uh, people in senior living. What's the one message that you have for them? Um, to me, one of the most important things is you really need to keep me engaged. You need to encourage me. If the best I can do is button my shirt, 
then praise me for buttoning that shirt, even if it's crooked. Um, let me stay engaged. You need to enable me. Don't do things for me and disable me. Enable me and keep me active. Um, the more stagnant we are, the more stagnant we become. So help us to stay engaged. And remember, we are the same people we were before. We're just a little bit different. But the person we were in our heart and soul, even when we have um, behavioral variant FTD or things that, that make us act just not the way you would like us to act, that's not really us. And that's not who we were. It's not who's in our heart. Thank you so much, Lori. Chuck? I think one of the most important things is we are not our disease. We are loving, caring individuals. We all have passions. We all have hopes. We all have dreams. We all have family. Um, and if you just treat our issues and not know who we are or have an idea where we came from, you're losing a lot because the more you know about us, the more maybe you can understand why we may have an episode of, um, you know, anger or something when it's something that is happening to us that we can't understand. You know, I have a, I have a severe back issue. If I sit too long in one place, my legs start tingling. It's very uncomfortable. That would be something that they would want to know, you know, by talking with the family, getting information on, on who this person was to be able to talk to them. And always remember one thing, we cannot come to your reality. You have to come to ours because we don't have the ability to. But if you come to our reality, you'll find a caring, loving individual there who only wants to communicate and to be treated as an individual and a person. So I'm reading one of the questions in the chat box and it says um, to both you, uh, Chuck and Lori, are there specific activities that help you with your memory loss? I would say engaging with other people um, is real important. Um, I play a number of games. I play about half an hour to 45 minutes of games every day, uh, word games. Um, I, I try Sudoku, but I'm not always really great at it, but um, just things that will help me to stretch beyond my limit. Um, and it doesn't always have to be games. It can be just activities. Uh, sometimes socializing with someone else can be just as much of an activity. Um, with the FTD part, I sometimes have issues with my speech, especially when I'm tired. So trying to maintain my vocabulary is important to me. So I try and learn one new word every day. Sometimes I knew the word, but I forgot it, but I try to relearn it. And that's also, I think, an important thing is to try and take the things you were good at and try not to let it totally fall to the background. Try and work on it so you can maintain at least some of it. Chuck, what helps you? What are some of the accommodations and things that help you? I think finding, finding your passion, whatever that is, and finding a way to do it. It may not have been your passion in the past, but it can be your passion now. And when you have a purpose, then you, you, your mindset can change and it needs to that have the mindset of, well, I'm going to do this. Now I'm going to find out a reason how I can and not, well, I shouldn't do this. So I'm not even going to try. Uh, one of my passions was golf. I still play golf. Um, I don't play it like I used to, but I sure enjoy it. Um, it kind of changes your 
perception of things. You enjoy things more. Um, I enjoy speaking, public speaking. And I'm on a lot of, of Zooms every month, you know, with DAA. And I, but it's my passion. Everybody has something different. But don't ever give up your loves. Whatever you love to do, find a way to do it and to continue to do it. You're not going to do it the same way you used to. But you will still be able to do it. And by doing it, that's going to put a smile on your face. Because for a small period of time, you're doing what you've always loved to do, and you can get lost in it. And for that period of time, everything is good. And that, that's all you can hope for. Oh, there's so many good questions. Um, and I, don't, I want, want to have time for them all. Um, yeah. here's, here's one that I think um, it would be really good to hear. When you're having a bad day, do you realize you're having a bad day? And how do you feel then? Lori, we're not hearing Sorry, you. Sorry, we can't hear you. Try again, Lori. All right, we've lost She's unmuted. you. Okay, yeah, how about now? Yeah, that's oh, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, boy, I didn't do good for my hair, did it? Um, <laughs> some days, some t days, yeah, I I know I'm having a bad day, and other days I don't. Um, I, it it can vary. Again, it's a roller coaster, and and so is the way I perceive things and how I take them. Uh, for me, one of the difficulties has been with personality changes and agitation and frustration. And I keep a little stress ball here. So when I'm getting frustrated, I can just, and then I have um, little dog here is, is uh, tell keep me calm. But it's difficult when, it's easier when you don't know you're having a bad day because when you know you're having a bad day and you can't really do anything about it, you can't change it. Um, it's hard. It's, it's, you see something coming out of yourself, either confusion, frustration, disorientation, you see yourself different. I mean, I, I was a, I was a professional, I was a career professional and now I, I can't remember how to make noodles. I was a professional and yet I can't remember how to make a bed. It hurts. It's sad. It makes you want to cry. It makes you frustrated. And how do you get out of it? That's, that's a tough one. Sometimes you need to just ride it through. Uh, my first go-to is my music. I put my headphones on, I get in my rocking chair and I have my, my music. Um, if when I can, uh, I go for a walk with somebody and I, I have to go with somebody else so I don't get lost. Um, sometimes getting outside and just listening to the birds, smelling the fresh air will help a little bit. And sometimes it doesn't matter what you do. It's just, you're just going to have to ride it out. But you know, I like to look at afterwards when I can say, whew, today's a new day. Today's a new hour and let's keep going. Um, what's important about music though, it needs to be my music. I've been to uh, residential facilities where everybody's got the same music. Um, that's not my music. I want my songs and my music because other, so other music may not help me at all it might set me off a little bit worse but when i have my music my tunes the things that i enjoy that will help chuck can you tell if you're having a bad day and if so what's that like um well there are times when i can't i i don't know and for instance this this has happened two or three times uh bobby and i'll get up and and kind of get ready to to go someplace and we go out and she goes what's wrong and i said nothing 
And if, you know, a few minutes later, she goes, what is bothering you? She goes, you're not, you're not yourself today. Something is wrong. And I'll think about it and, oh, I have a headache. I, I didn't, I knew that, I didn't know that it was there, you know, until she saw that my attitude, everything had changed. Um, and when you're having a bad day with me, it used to be frustration, pure frustration that turns into anger. When you try to do something and it just completely goes awry. Um, one instance was I, um, in the early stages, I tried to mount our TVs. Well, I put the mounting bracket upside down. And I got so angry with myself. And so we, we sat down and decided that I was doing these things because of my disease. So we named my disease. My disease is called Chucky. And when Chucky arrives, uh, who knows what's gonna happen? And I, I, I can't control what Chucky does, but I can control my reaction to what Chucky does. And in, in moments when it's frustration and everything, just by saying, oh, that was Chucky, we can kind of smile about it. And it doesn't, the, the, it takes kind of the frustration away. It takes the anger away. And if I forget to do something or do something wrong when Bobby asks me, she'll say, oh, well, looks like Chucky's here today, huh? And I'll say, yep. You know, and it, and it takes a lot of the tension away because we can't control what we do. We can't control what goes through our minds. Um, but yet we, we can work on not beating ourselves up inside because it's not our fault. And being able to just smile about things that go wrong. Well, I shouldn't have done that. And it, it takes all of that fear and frustration because the care partner, they senses, they feel the fear because they're watching you do something. And they're probably watching you do it wrong. And it may, may be very simple. So they have that fear of, he can't do that. Or she can't do that. And by being able to kind of smile about it and, and keep that, you know, a little bit of humor in it. And it's not to say that it doesn't happen because it sure the heck does. And sometimes I talked about that door, I keep everything behind. But sometimes that door comes open and I can't control it. And it takes me a few minutes to get all of those images, all of that stuff back behind the door. And it might do me in for the entire day when, when something like that happens. So there has to be an understanding of what, what we're doing and how we're doing it and why we're doing it. I think it's, and, and communication between whoever your partner is and you is essential to be able to understand what each other is going through. Well, um, yeah. we're not gonna be able to get to all the different questions, but I did want, and um, Charles, if you wouldn't mind going to our last slide, uh, that there's yeah, a lot of information yeah. on our website for people. So please don't feel we're leaving you high and dry. We've got, um, an online resources center, uh, podcasts, online discussions, uh, a lot of things to help on um, support. Sorry, Charles, go ahead. No, no, I was, I was, I, I wanted to have time for this. I was going to ask you, what can we do? What can everyone do for your organization, Karen? I find that your work is truly amazing. I've had a number of times personally where I had goosebumps with a uh, Chuck and Lori's testimonies, and I'm not. I know I'm not the only one. So I want to thank you for this um, and, and really helping us get these insights. I encourage anyone on the line uh, right now to consider um, the different avenues to learn more from the Dementia Action Alliance. I know that somebody in the chat was uh, placing the, the um, you, have, you have a monthly uh, work groups, correct, Karen? We do. We have uh, yeah. arts technology and optimizing yeah. well-being. Okay. 
So just maybe to close, what's the one thing that you invite people to do uh, regarding DAA today, Karen? Get involved. If, okay. if what, <laughs> Great. Whatever way that you can, we have lots of pathways okay. and doorways, but, but get yeah. involved. It takes, it takes a village to change you know, mindsets Absolutely. and understanding. So I want to thank you, Karen, and your organization and everyone in the ecosystem to help us um, make these journeys uh, living with meaning and purpose. And with that, I'm going to finish off with Karen's email. Um, I know a lot of questions were not answered, but like Chuck and Laurie were saying, this is a discussion, a conversation, and we want to have many, many, many of these. So with that, from the bottom of my heart, Karen, Chuck and Laurie, thank you for joining. Thank you everyone for being here today. As a quick reminder, we have a huddle at 2 p.m. that starts right now. And um, yeah, thank you again for the meaningful and purpose that you bring in everybody's uh, life, uh, Karen. Thank you for having us so very much and to do the work that you all are doing because you're getting people together, which is hugely important. So Absolutely, thank anytime. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Chuck. Bye, Lori. Thank you for being Bye. with us today. Bye. Thank you. Yep. Thank you all. Karen, this was amazing. Um, yeah, this was truly amazing.